I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Dr. James Woodward, a professor emeritus of history and an adjunct professor of physics at California State University, Fullerton. Dr. Woodward is known for his work on the Mach effect, which postulates that energy storing ions experience transient mass fluctuations when accelerated and could be used as a reactionless drive for space travel. Unlike conventional technologies, drives based on the Mach effect don't need to release matter in order to generate thrust. He joins us today to discuss his research into the Mach effect, along with his research team's experimental work on something they've dubbed the Mega Drive. So James, welcome, sir. Uh, so today we are talking about merging propulsion, and the basis for this is Mach's principle, right? So can you describe Mach's principle for the layperson to start us out? Actually, to be perfectly honest, we have been backing away a little bit from calling it Mach's principle, chiefly because Mach's principle is an ill-defined concept in mainstream physics, and it evokes a whole bunch of ideas and stuff that are only really marginally related sometimes to the physics involved. What we do now is we talk about gravitational induction of inertia, which is the physics of Mach's principle. Gravitational induction of inertia is really fairly simple. What it says is that all of that junk out there in the distant universe that's within the so-called past light cone and past particle horizon of where we are contributes to a gravitational potential locally here, which is the effect of that matter out there. And the gravitational potential in the local area here, and for that matter, everywhere in the universe all the time, turns out to be the square of the vacuum speed of light which is the invariant of special relativity. Okay, That square of the vacuum speed of light just means that E equals mc squared, or you can equivalently say E equals m phi, where phi is the total nodal Newtonian gravitational potential. If this is the case, it turns out that when you accelerate an object, that field flashes into life. Normally, you don't even detect it or think about it. It flashes into life, and it produces a reaction force on the thing that you're accelerating that pushes back on you when you try to accelerate it. And if phi is equal to c squared everywhere and everyone, it turns out reaction forces are always equal and opposite to applied forces. OK, so. That's the basic idea. The basic idea of this drive is to take advantage of inertial forces because they are gigantic gravitational forces in general relativity, according to Einstein, and see if they can be implemented to produce a way of how, should I put it, latching on to the field of the universe and pushing off without having to throw anything out a tailpipe. Uh, this calculation is a little bit subtle, but not really too subtle. And it says, yes, indeed, there are such forces. They are transient effects, transient things that happen to the rest mass of objects which are squishy. That is to say, they're extended objects made up of multiple parts so that the object can absorb and release energy as a function of time, as in charging or discharging a capacitor. And if you accelerate it at the same time, you couple it to this field of the universe, characterized by phi is equal to c squared, and you can produce much larger forces than you would expect to be able to if you were just pushing and pulling on something where the rest mass fluctuation was going as E over C squared from the energy being put into it. Okay. Uh, devices 
You want me to go on and talk about devices? That well, if it's okay, yeah, I I want to set this up a little bit for the audience. Okay. So in terms of devices, if it's okay, um, you, so the Mega Drive, this is what your team has dubbed this. This is mm -hmm. using basically piezoelectric transducers, right? Uh -huh. And and so you have a tiny little mass that you can think of it as wiggling very very fast. And mm -hmm. the the idea, if I understand it right, is you're coupling this wiggling of this tiny little mass to the basically the gravitational potential of the universe, right? Uh huh. So yes. yeah. Now again, I you you have been covered in you've been covered in I believe Wired magazine, um, many national publications. You've made a lot of headlines, and mm -hmm. the, you know the work that you're doing is remarkable. I think that most people are familiar uh, with your team's you know continual progress. I mean, the the piezo transducer model is something that I think you've been working on for close to twenty years now. Um, what are some of the, if you could describe it in a little bit of detail, um, where is that research at right now? That research is slowly hobbling along, uh, chiefly because of medical issues, particularly that I've experienced in the last six months or so, but we're getting going again. As a matter of fact, I we take data in our system by making a movie of a display, a computer display. And I've got a movie or two of data that was taken actually a few days ago. And I've got a movie of <clears throat> a run done last August, which went almost perfectly. The device is on the right. It's a brass cylinder more or less in the center. The piezoelectric stack is to the left. There's an aluminum cap that clamps it further to the left and you see it moving in this picture. That's a movie of what's actually going on. On the left are three displays. The one in the center bottom is the waveforms of several signals that are applied to the device that were generated by the device. The one the bottom left is a fast Fourier transform real-time display of the frequencies in the current applied to the device. Okay. And then above that is a strip chart recording of the actual run. The red trace in the strip chart recording is the actual position of the device. The brown trace is a strain gauge signal from within the stack. And the blue trace is the volume, the, the voltage being applied to the device during the run. And I'm going to rerun it again so you have a couple of times. Wonderful. Now, okay. if I could yeah. ask, it looks like there is an upward trend there. Could we interpret that as being thrust? Uh, what you can interpret as being thrust are, let me use my pointer here, is the red trace. You see it come on here, then it goes strongly negative, and then strongly positive, like so. Those are the thrust transients being generated by the device, then it continues on. What we're looking at is a sweep of uh, five kilohertz from 41 to 50, 36 kilohertz in 10 seconds. 10 seconds is from here to here. And then it does it again from here to here. And again, from here to here. And again, from here to here, okay? So the thrust transient that is swept is swept between about 38 and 36 kilohertz, okay? So you get a little quiescent part coming in and then you get the positive going and then negative going and then positive going again. That's the frequency sweeping over the thrust transients, okay? 
And so it's that large fluctuation in the red trace that is the effect. Okay. Oh, right. okay. Now, and and again for the audience, um, this is described as you're you're basically pushing against the net gravitational field of the universe. So of the he, universe. Let me explain how you know that this is something other than just simple Newtonian vibrations. You talk about Martin and his students' critique. Their critique was that we're not looking at nothing but Newtonian vibrations. Okay, so it's just classical physics of things wiggling and you see stuff. Uh, the way you can tell that that's wrong is using the conservation of momentum. The device is set up on a very sensitive thrust balance and on that very sensitive thrust balance, you feed in energy to the device to make the stack of crystals vibrate. And you do so in such a way that you do not insert any momentum into the system. That means that the total momentum of the system throughout this process has to remain zero in the sense that the center of mass of the device does not change in location and space. Okay. Uh, this is because if you actuate the piezoelectric stack, conservation of momentum requires that as part of the stack goes this way with some velocity, an equal and opposite amount of stuff has to go the other way with the same momentum so that the total momentum of the separating parts remain zero and the center of mass remains fixed, okay? If there is a real force present, as we claim, then it should be the case that as this part of the stack goes this way and a real force is present, it will entrain the rest of the stack and other stuff with it so that they will move together with a slight time delay like so. Okay, now the reason why this run is so special is because you can actually see the stack going one way and the other in a very clear fashion, okay? Yeah, and, and if it, you'd like, it'd be wonderful to run that again if, if you want to yes, give it a I shot. Will, I will run it again, and I will also run something recent, which is messier. I will, what I want to do also is talk a little bit about Michelle Broyles tracker work. Okay. Well, and, it, and I, that's, I, that's important I, to mention, Jim, I'm, that you have a team of people working with you. This is not just you by yourself. Absolutely. This is not a one man show by any stretch of the imagination. Hal Fern's contributions have been immense. Yeah. You know, the, uh, NIAC phase two people, Jose Rodal and a bunch of other people have been, Paul March in particular, have been very helpful. And there is a small team now working on it. consists of me and uh, Hal is taking a sabbatical and retiring. Uh, but Michelle Broyles, David Jenkins, Paul March, and occasionally Jose, Jose gets his tops in two that's going on okay so that said understand that this is a team project this is not just yours truly okay here we go i will run the thing again so you have it to work with okay now you come up on the first transient there's the first transient and it goes back and Settles down, coming up on the second transient, the second transient. And you can see that the frequency is getting a bit lower and the transients are getting larger. And the last one is the most spectacular. And you can see the device wiggling in correspondence to the red trace on the screen. Yeah. Now, when people see these graphs, 
I think it's important for them to keep in mind that you, this is actually a mechanical device. And I follow a lot of your email updates and I know that your team has struggled with all sorts of mechanical issues, right? I mean, when you're pushing stuff like piezo transmitters, um, you, you have a lot of other small mechanical components. When you're pushing those to their limits, they break down, they fail, and they don't always <laughs> respond the way that you think they will. So I think it's important for people to remember that this is something that you've mechanically built and you were testing. And for me, this just helps to make, uh, it makes the whole thing more real to keep in mind that there are challenges that you have to overcome on an engineering level every single day. Okay. That said, this one was an almost perfect run. Uh, what I'm gonna show you next is Michelle's result. The way in which we, as I say, the way in which we show that what we're doing is generating a real force as opposed to Martin and his students' vibrations is by showing that all of the parts of the device move together as time goes by. Uh, and in order to do that, what we did was we added, as you can see here, a black dot on the brass reaction mass and a black dot on the aluminum block that holds the rods on which this device runs. The much larger forces that we see generated are due largely to use the implementation of a suspension system that makes it so that the device can vibrate like mad at high frequencies, but at very low frequencies will transfer force to whatever it's connected to. What you're looking at here are index marks for a program called Tracker that Michelle found that will actually compute the displacement of those points with respect to a fixed reference. Okay, so what you see here is in this part of the display is the run that you just saw, but without the uh, all the associated stuff in the foreground. What she then did was calculate the position of those two black dots to get these two traces here and here. And what she shows is that if you look at them, she lines them all up so that they're synchronously reading data. What you see is that those two points produce the same sort of trace as the red trace in the first display. And when they analyzed in detail, what you discover is that indeed everything is moving in the same direction at the, uh, roughly the same time, small time delays for signal propagation and so on. <clears throat> what you have there is empirical proof that, that a real force is being generated in the device. The conditions of the experiment though, are such that if you exclude a bunch of things that might be going on, which we do, that only the gravitational hypothesis is left. And so we regard this as the best evidence so far that indeed we are looking at a real gravitational effect and that it will indeed satisfy the desires of NASA and be able to be scaled up to produce large forces that are suitable for accelerating spacecraft. Uh, now, this, see, these are a bunch of runs that were done several days ago on the 28th of April. And as you can see from what's displayed on the screen, the, 
there are these are picoscope traces of this runs. You can see that there are a bunch of runs that look sort of like what you saw in the almost perfect run. The closest one to it is run five. And so I am going to do run five, play run five for you now. Uh, that's if I can move us out of the way. There we are. Okay. All right. This is run five a few days ago. Okay. Okay. As you can see from this display, <laughs> as you can see from this display, the red trace is more or less like it was in the almost perfect run. The voltage trace is showing the little dips at the tra transient trans. Uh, it's a transient transit and the uh, strain gauge isn't working. The weed must have fallen off. Okay. Uh, if you look at the other windows, you see the same sort of thing. You see the same pattern of fast Fourier trans transforms of the uh, current to the device undergo fluctuations where the second harmonic comes on very strongly during the transit transits and so on. And the waveforms are pretty much those of six months ago. Uh, the result's not as clean and pretty, but the device in question has gone through a lot of work during that time. It's not in as good, perfect condition as it was last summer. Okay. All right. Now. Well, you know, I think that's, this... that's important to point out from, from what I recall from things that you've said in the past, these devices do tend to tear themselves apart a bit over time, right? Slowly. Yes. Yeah. Actually what the worst, the worst wear turns out to be in the bearings and rods on which the device runs. The reason why that's important is because getting the thing to oscillate freely at the 36 or 37 kilohertz range where the effect takes place is absolutely essential. And the reason why we're seeing much larger forces on the order of hundreds of micronewtons now, as opposed to a micronewton or two back in the days when Martin was checking up on us. Uh, what you find, let me get this out of here. Okay. What you find is that the wear and tear on the rods is the main problem. And the rods for the device presently are okay, but they are not as perfect as they were back last summer when that run was gotten. Uh, okay. Now, Suffice it to say what we're looking at is something where there is a real effect. It's on the order of at least tens of micronewtons and arguably 100 micronewtons or more. Uh, that's to say a tenth of a millinewton. Uh, we've seen larger effects when things were working better. Uh, but what we have not yet done is settled down and gotten a set of runs 
that produce a data set that make a simple and straightforward case for the effect being real. But there uh, is a real effect there. Thing to keep in mind you have in the questions that you were going to ask me, uh, is there any evidence for mock Mach's principle? And, uh, or that is, is there any evidence for the gravitational induction of inertia? And the answer to that question is simple, yes. Every time you push on something and it pushes back on you, you are in effect testing the gravitational induction of inertia. Okay, because all of those commonplace forces that absent an explanation of this sort have no explanation other than, well, it's inertia. Okay, well, no, it's not just inertia. It's a gravitational action that exists in matter in the universe. And as I say, every time you push on something, you're testing the principle. Yeah, and from what I understand, in a big way, Mach's principle and you know related concepts are really they go back to first principles in science, right? I mean, this is right at the bottom level of absolutely. Of okay, well, yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. I I sincerely appreciate it, and I think it helps the audience to be able to see these test runs. Um, so, I guess one of the one of the questions would be. Um, well, let me see. I have this whole list of questions here. I'm going to have to edit, you know, a whole bunch of this stuff. But, um, you know, one thing I'd wondered is, if I understand correctly, you've described a lot of the physics behind this from a relativistic perspective, right? This is coming out of, uh, um, you know, relativity theory. Have you looked mm -hmm. at this from a quantum perspective or potentially like uh, quantum gravity, any of the newer models, I guess? Actually, gravity and inertia are prior to quantum effects. Arguably, I know it's it's fashionable to try and explain inertia in terms of quantum effects, and it's also fashionable to try and explain inertia in terms of electrodynamics. And both ideas are, as far as I am concerned, uh, misguided. Quantum effects don't really have anything to do with inertia because quantum particles have inertia by assumption, the way everything does. Okay, so if you're explaining inertia, explaining it in terms of, well, how should I put it? General relativity has not yet been quantized. Yeah. And general relativity is the level at which you find inertia as a physical phenomenon. And it's in general relativity that inertia finds its explanation as a gravitational induction of inertia. And that does not need quantum mechanics. Uh, it doesn't need electrodynamics either. Electrodynamics is popular because it is a simpler field theory than general relativity. You know, everybody sort of thinks they understand electrodynamics and you know, it would be great if you could explain gravity in terms of electrodynamics. And many years ago, I was in that camp. I would have been delighted to see an electromagnetic explanation of gravity and inertia. Uh, but I have come to learn that that's not possible, that gravity and inertia are a tensor field theory whereas uh, electrodynamics is a vector field theory. Hmm. And so trying to make a tensor theory out of a vector theory, I suppose you can try and do it, but it's unlikely to be really successful as a general explanation. The long and the short of it is, if you want to understand gravity and inertia, you have to understand general relativity. And yeah. you you know, it, it's as simple as that. Well, and I, I was just curious about the, the actual mechanism involved. Again, I, for me, it's it's difficult in some ways to visualize this idea of 
you're literally pushing against the, the you know the the aggregate mass of the entire universe right and you know so i i was thinking about quantum foam right where they talk about these virtual particles in the background and that i know there are a bunch of you know uh <clears throat> there are a bunch of attempts to unify gravity and, and relativity none of which have been spectacularly successful that i know of but um, you know, but I thought maybe maybe there was a mechanism on, you know, on the micro scale that might help explain this that you were partial to. Yeah, but you see, the language is already a problem. You're talking about virtual par particles in space time for your quantum effects. But when you understand what Einstein intended for general relativity, Space time is the gravitational and inertial field. Hmm. Okay. So, what you're talking about is virtual particles of a field in itself, which is redundant and not, not so far at any rate, and especially helpful. Okay. From our point of view, let me explain. From our point of view, we're primarily interested in the practical consequences of this. Yeah. We want to build stuff that will actually fly. Uh, and so worrying about whether or not this or that quantum effect is related to what's going on is not as important as getting the stuff to work. Uh, and you don't need all that quantum stuff in order to end, understand what's going on. What you're doing is you're taking a set of piezoelectric elements, which are capacitors, and you are putting energy into them as you charge them up. And that energy is changing the energy density in the capacitor and at the same time, either compressing or distending it, depending upon the polarity of the voltage. So you're automatically changing the, both the energy density and the acceleration of the material at the same time. And those are the conditions which produce the transient mass, mass effects that we use in our so-called Mach effect of gravity assist, that is mega impulse engines. You know, uh, we're hoping to be moving along a little bit more quickly in the future uh, and following up on this. But at the time and for the past several months, it's been pretty slow, owing chiefly to, well, in my case, it ended up as a heart valve replacement. So, you know, it's not trivial medical concerns that have been slowing us down. Absolutely. Um, now, in terms of scaling this effect, from what I recall, mm -hmm. you've talked about potentially running these in parallel right that may be one yes. way to do it you could also stack the piezo devices in a serial manner as well right mm -hmm. uh they can be stacked serially if you want running them in parallel all running them in parallel says is that you're applying the same voltage to all of the stacks at the same time uh and it's the full voltage of the power source if you had a weak power source uh, you would probably try and run them in serial to keep the drain current from overloading the system. But if your power supply is large enough, you want to run them in parallel. And you want them all to run sufficiently alike each other so that they're all doing at least up to some reasonable time variation, the same thing at the same time. That's the main problem that we're facing now. Each one of the devices is handmade and each one has its own personality, its own transient frequency, uh, which may be a little different from others and so on. Uh, actually, David Jenkins is trying to work on a fix for this. He's an expert in building amplifiers and he's building an amplifier, a prototype amplifier for us that will let us run three or four of the devices and independently specify the waveforms for the three or four devices so that the transient transit 
for all of them can be matched up and be at the same time. And he's been having the sort of a troubles that you have in developing a new amplifier design and so on. But he tells us that he's pretty close to getting it done. Yeah. And is into tests, fly power tests of his amplifier. So work is progressing on that front too. Shell is working primarily on the next step. That is to say ways to suspend the devices so they oscillate freely while transmitting any steady force to whatever they're attached to. Uh, she's using a so-called spider web design, which looks like the sensible way to go forward. As soon as we get a data set for a paper on this out of what we're doing here at Fullerton, we will be following in the shell steps. You know, so there's progress, but it's slow because Michelle, as a matter of fact, last week went through heart surgery too. Uh, ablation of various nodes and all that, and some other surgical uh, things done. You know, so it's been a cold winter. But it, we're getting... Absolutely. It, although... You know, I want to point out for the audience, you're getting net effects, right? So that in itself, on any scale, that's a giant breakthrough. You have, a, you know, propulsion that is truly reactionless. You're pushing against the universe. And then I think the other thing that's important to point out is that even with very small amounts of thrust, this could be really valuable for satellite propulsion, right? For helping to change orbits for helping to uh, build speed, you know, in, in long distance space propulsion, right? So even small amounts of thrust are very useful, which is why ion drives are so popular with NASA. Yes, thank you for the kind words, Tim. <laughs> they are much appreciated, uh, especially after the discussions I've been through recently on a, on a chat list about Mach's principle and gravitational induction of inertia and all that. Uh, but there appears to be a little bit of progress there too. So I can't complain. Yeah, no, it's, I guess the way I would summarize where we are is we're going through what really constitutes serious developments of a difficult principle and so on. Uh, and that none of us should be surprised that things have worked out the way they have. Well, aside from the medical stuff, which was an unexpected opportunity to get to know about a lot of stuff that I had not paid attention to. Ah, uh, okay. On that note, let me say thank you so much for your time today. And let me just express what a tremendous honor it is to be able to interview you about this research. The work that you have been doing is absolutely groundbreaking. And one of the things that just continues to impress me is the tenacity and diligence that you put into this, not just yourself, but your entire team, you know, and, and that is why it is truly an honor to be able to interview you about this. So thank you for that. Thank you, Tim. And I will, on behalf of my colleagues, thank you for them too. Yes, they have made extraordinary contributions to the development of a, a speculative project. Let me close things down for today. But um, before we go, I do want to ask, what do you expect to see coming next? Um, what are your plans for the remainder of this year? Do you have any future tests or enhancements planned for this device that we should expect to see news on? Yes, the uh, thing that has held up getting any experimental stuff done is a vacuum system. We're working on an upgrade for the vacuum system. Curtis Horn, a former student of Hal's, has been working with us for a year or two. And he's got a turbo pump set up that's going to be inserted to, to our system so that we can get higher vacuum. So that's going to happen presumably in a couple of weeks. We've ordered the parts and 
Curtis tells me the parts are on the way to him. And so we'll be doing that week after next. And it's really been a pleasure talking with you, Tim. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Jim, thank you again so much for your time today, sir. Our pleasure. Thank you.